is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. You're listening to DNA Today, a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. DNA Today informs you on what's happening in the genetic world. During my broadcast, I educate the public on genetic and public health topics through event coverage, news stories, book movie reviews, and interviews. Guests include genetic counselors, researchers, patient advocates, and professors in the field of genetics. Joining me today is Dr. Melina Fan. She is Chief Scientific Officer and co-founder of AdGene. AdGene is a nonprofit organization that operates a plasmid repository for the research community, and we'll get into what that actually means. The organization works with thousands of laboratories to assemble high-quality library of published plasmids for use in research and discovery. A little bit about our guest, Dr. Melina Fan received her PhD in cell biology from Harvard University, where she studied diabetes and metabolism. Melina has worked at Genetics Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Sequina Therapeutics in San Diego, California. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology from MIT. That is quite a resume. It's an honor to have you on the show. Thanks, Kira. It's great to be here. So let's get into it. AdGene is a plasmid repository for the research community. Can you explain what this actually means in you know, layman's terms and maybe starting with what a plasmid is? Right. So a plasmid is a small circle of DNA that's widely used by life science researchers. By breaking down our genetic code into smaller, more easily manipulated parts, we can ask extremely targeted questions about how each DNA sequence functions. So to kind of put it in perspective, let's say the human genome contains maybe 20 to 25,000 genes. Um, Researchers want to know what each of those genes does. And one way that scientists can test this is by isolating individual genes and putting them in plasmids. So for example, RAS is a gene that uh, when mutated can cause cancer. So let's just say a scientist was curious about it. They could take the RAS gene, put it in a plasmid, um, and maybe even put in a mutation in RAS that's similar to what a patient might have. Then they could put that plasmid into a cell line or even into an organism to see if it causes cell proliferation or cancer-like phenotypes. Um, you can imagine that the, the repository part of, part of this is that you could imagine that once a scientist published a paper that showed that their plasmid containing the mutant RAS can cause cell proliferation, say in pancreatic cells, other scientists would read the paper and then they would want to have access to that plasmid so they could test mutant RAS in their own disease models. So for example, they could see if that caused the promotion of lung cancer. And this all requires plasmid sharing or reagent sharing for them to ask those scientific questions. Um, Science has always relied on building on the work of others. And for that reason, journals encourage scientists to share their research materials so that others can validate their work and conduct additional experiments. However, before AdGene, it was difficult for scientists to share plasmids. Labs are focused on research rather than the logistical complexities of shipping materials, handling legal paperwork, and answering and keeping track of follow-up questions. So AdGene created a central repository where scientists can deposit their plasmids and make them available at a really low cost to scientists everywhere. We're actually a nonprofit, and our mission is to promote scientific sharing with the ultimate goal of accelerating research and discovery. Currently, we have about 2,500 depositing labs and nearly 50,000 plasmids in our repository. We ship about 125,000 plasmids per year, and actually just over half of them go to scientists outside of the United States. So it's truly a global community of researchers. What's a couple of your favorite plasmids? Any cool genes that are inserted into plasmids? Yes. So um, so what I love about working at AdGene is the wide variety of scientific fields that we serve. So we have plasmids that contain genes from a wide variety of different species, human, mouse, fly, worm, bacteria, corn, you name it. And um, we have scientists working on everything from Alzheimer's to biofuels. And so for me, this has been um, really expansive compared to my PhD, where I really worked on focused on one thing. Um, and that's one of the things I really do like about working at AdGene. You're not working with the, the same types of bacteria or, you know, mouse models that you really get to explore so many different genes and um, different study, fields of study in terms of like cancer and Alzheimer's. Absolutely. Any 
organism, which is most organisms that have DNA in them, would be able to use plasmids as a research tool. And so for that reason, it does span many different fields. And this is because DNA is such a universal code that any organism can read the DNA code. That's right. I mean, it, what's really amazing is how often we'll take a gene from one species and put it in a different one and it'll, it'll still work. So what are a couple examples of those? Well, so one example that um, I'd like to talk about in one of our most popular plasmids is uh, the fluorescent protein. So green fluorescent protein comes from jellyfish. And um, it's very, we have a very extensive collection of fluorescent proteins that now span a wide variety of different colors. And they're very heavily requested because they're useful research tools. So the way that these proteins work is they get excited when light of a certain wavelength is shined on them and then they emit light at a different wavelength. And in its most basic form, scientists can fuse their favorite protein of interest to one of these fluorescent proteins and then put it in cells and see which part of the cells they localize to by looking under a fluorescent microscope. And this gives them hints about the protein's function depending where it, where it is in the cell. So it's kind of like the cell having a little glow-in-the-dark flag saying, I'm over here, it worked, the gene is here. Exactly. So the protein would be, is it in the nucleus, which might mean that it's involved with transcription or many other things that could be happening in the nucleus, or does it go to um, the mitochondria or which part of the, the cell membrane? I think that gives scientists a lot of uh, hints about the function. But actually, to be honest, fluorescent proteins have been modified to do all kinds of much more crazy things than that. That's just kind of the most basic thing that people would do with it. It's used all over research. I've used it in student labs and way beyond that. So take us through the process of how plasmids are actually inserted into these cells. We're talking about fusing them with a gene of interest that a researcher is using. Is this a complex process? Is it relatively simple? Give us an idea. I'm glad you asked. It, it depends on the cells that you're working with. Um, so many of our plasmids are actually used for mammalian cells. And in that case, the plasmids are introduced to the cells directly by either transfection, which is um, generally a chemical method or a physical method, such as poking holes in the cell membrane. Um, but it can also be introduced via viral delivery. And many of adenes plasmids actually have elements on them that allow scientists to package the DNA into viral particles. And the viruses have been modified from the standard viruses that make you sick, so they can be safely used in the lab. Uh, and adgene has recently, just in the last month, started a new service that offers ready-to-use viral particles for some of our common plasmids, and that makes it easier for scientists to deliver that genetic information into cells. So is it kind of something that um, if a researcher were wanting to create their own plasmid, say they're starting from scratch, is this something that's a relatively easy process they can do on their own, or do they usually have to look at an outside lab to help them if it's a new one? Obviously, if it's one that's been established, they can go to Adgene and just order it. Right, so there are a variety of different ways to create plasmids. Uh, traditionally, people could, say, do a PCR and get a gene and then clone it using restriction enzymes into a plasmid. Um, and that typically could take a couple weeks, and then if things are more difficult, it could take longer. And that's part of why people do like coming to Adgene for not only things that are ready to use, but also things that have been published and validated. More recently, gen gene synthesis has come about, and so now people can actually request full plasmids that they give the sequence to a company. The company would actually synthesize the sequence that they want and deliver a ready-to-use plasmid. Um, I think certainly in industry people are using it, and some academics are also using it. Uh, generally, the problems are cost. It's relatively expensive, and then the turnaround time to actually get the material. So is this similar to genetic engineering where, or editing where you're actually creating a gene? It is where you're actually creating a gene. So you would send them the sequence and they would base by base build the exact sequence that you're looking for. They may only make the insert for you, the, the gene or the part that goes in, and then they would take, probably they would take a backbone, which is something that's meant that all plasmids have, and then they would just put it in there so they don't need to synthesize the whole backbone. And the backbone is what allows that plasmid to be um, propagated in bacteria. So one thing I didn't talk about earlier is um, one of the reasons plasmids are such a good tool is once you have a plasmid, you kind of have an infinite supply of it because you can put it in bacteria and there's an origin of replication in that backbone that allows the plasmids to divide as the bacteria divide. So it's almost like you've got your own little plasmid factory inside of the bacteria where you can have as much as you want. And it's 
replicates independently of the DNA to give people kind of an idea. Plasmids are separate from um, the organism's genome, right? It's not in the nucleus necessarily. That's right. So, well, certainly in bacteria, it's a separate, you know, entity. And in the delivery, as I was talking about earlier with virus, uh, for some of them, what happens is that DNA sequence in the end will actually get delivered and then integrated into the genome. But for the vast majority of cases, you're absolutely right. It's it be, it's a separate DNA sequence that's outside of the, the host genome. Now, how do scientists benefit from submitting their plasmids to AdGene? What are some of the things that AdGene is able to provide them once they've submitted that new plasmid? Right. So it's usually pretty easy for people to see the benefits of scientists that request plasmids from AdGene because they're here they have a central searchable database of quality controlled plasmids. But what's the incentive for labs to deposit? So there are a variety of reasons. One is that it saves the lab time. This is a big one. Um, they simply deposit each plasmid once, and then we take care of all the future requests, including logistics such as how to ship to China, Brazil, other countries that can be tricky. Um, some labs had a technician that spent half their time just answering plasmid requests, wow. and now that technician can be devoted to research. Uh, another reason is that scientists believe in open sharing, and this is very heartwarming for me. We're a nonprofit resource, resource for the community, and many scientists are passionate about fueling scientific progress through sharing. So plasmids that are deposited to AdGene are actually often requested more often than if they hadn't been because now they're in this searchable database. And so what ends up happening is scientists who deposit actually get more visibility for their research and actually... Um, downstream of that, more citations, because as people use their materials, they are asked to cite the lab and the publication in future publications. And so it's actually a great idea for young scientists and for all scientists um, to kind of get their materials out there to the community. And finally, Adjean acts as a backup archive. So we've had scientists who've had freezer meltdowns or lost samples simply because of lab turnover. And Adjean's been able to replace their samples so that those research tools aren't lost. So it kind of, to me, sounds like a no-brainer. If I'm a scientist, I want to send it, you know, at least for the backup, but also for the ripple effect of having so many other scientists have access to my new plasmid and to be able to build upon my own research. Absolutely. And it's free to deposit as well. And we have scientists here at Adjean that help with the deposit process. And I think that's why we've been very fortunate that we've had a very large set of scientists who are interested in sharing their materials through Adjean. How did labs do this before? I've seen on Twitter some labs expressing, it's hard to remember how they got by before Adjean. How did scientists previously share their plasmids with other researchers? Was it very one-on-one, -on -one, hey, I've done this, do you want to use this? Was there anything more large scale? That's a great question. So actually, I started Adjean because of difficulties that I had with getting plasmids when I was a graduate student in Bruce Spiegelman's lab. So I conducted a screen for proteins that interacted with my lab's favorite protein, PGC1. I found maybe 20 different binding proteins, and I emailed 20 different labs, and that's kind of what people did. I'd do a search on PubMed, find the articles that were relevant, and see who had the plasmids and just write to them. And I wanted to test if the interactions that I had found in my screen were real, so I needed to be able to produce those proteins. Um, out of the 20 people I wrote to, maybe only half of them got back to me, and the time it took for the plasmids to arrive was highly variable. So that impacted the speed and direction of my research, and I knew there had to be a better way for scientists to share. So it kind of sounds like the Google of plasmids is what Adgene is. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but including including physical materials that we can actually ship to people. I am glad you mentioned that, though, because a lot of what we share is, is information as well as the physical material. So what kind of information do you provide on your website and with other scientists? Yeah, so usually when people deposit to us, they will give us information about how they made the plasmid, similar to what we were discussing before. How do you actually make this? So you have the backbone. So what backbone is it? What restriction sites do you use? What gene is in this? Um, what is the purpose of this? And we'll link also to that pu publication that shows that it works. Um, Adgene also does do its own quality control. So we will sequence, validate everything that we send out. And up until now, we've been sequencing just the key regions of plasmids, but now we've started to get into full plasmid sequence, and that's something we're trying to add to more and more plasmids as time goes on. And then we'll post that full sequence, or even the partial sequences, on our website so scientists can use that as they're doing their experiments. So for researchers looking for a particular plasmid, how do they actually access this through Adgene? How does Adgene assist in their quest to find this specific plasmid? 
Right. So all of our materials are discoverable to search engines, such as Google, as you mentioned. And that helps a lot. A lot of people just find us directly when they're searching for things on Google. Uh, but in addition to that, people who know about Agin and who come directly to our website, we also do have a search feature. We have a browse feature. And then we have a set of scientists here who write this educational content that goes around the plasmid. So what I had talked about previously was data about the plasmid, but we would have information, let's just say, about how all fluorescent proteins work and things like that, where we can group category group plasmids into categories and provide information about them. CRISPR is another great example where we pull a lot of information from the literature, provide that, and then also link to the relevant plasmids. Can anyone then, access this plasmid database or do you need to be, you know, in a certain lab or is there a restriction? Right. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, so Agene's website information is freely available to all scientists and people who want to be scientists as well. But the actual materials, the vast majority of our plasmids are only available to academic or nonprofit researchers. But if um, students are interested, they can go on your website and learn about specific plasmids and read all the information. Absolutely. Actually, our most popular web pages are the really um, introductory protocols that we have for students who are learning how to do molecular biology. Things like how to pour a gel, how to do a transformation into bacteria, that sort of thing. The 101. Exactly, the 101. <laughs> Those are our most popular. You mentioned CRISPR. Um, CRISPR is just huge, taking biology by storm. For those that don't remember what CRISPR is, it's a genetic editing technology that I've discussed extensively on the show. Um, what are some of these tools that Agene offers for CRISPR that's really just becoming ginormous? Yeah, it's been so fun for us to be part of the whole CRISPR revolution. Um, what's interesting is actually gene editing technologies have been around for many years, starting with zinc fingers and then talons and then most recently CRISPRs. And as a repository, we have um, a unique window into how these technologies are being adopted by scientists. And we've been able to kind of look at the number of requests for each one. And CRISPR has really blown everything away. And I think part of that is just because it is much easier for labs to get started with using this. And so we've seen really an incredible amount of adoption of CRISPR. Um, we're on pace to ship about 25,000 CRISPR plasmids this year alone. And um, our educational CRISPR web pages, as I mentioned earlier, they're probably going to get a total of about a million page views this year. So, you know, to say the least, it's exploding. Absolutely. And you were and so, involved um, yeah. with uh, a paper about CRISPR and um, on the Zika virus, which is also another really hot topic right now that a lot of people are concerned about. Um, it was in the academic journal Cell. Your team developed a rapid, low-cost detection method of the virus using CRISPR. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, so, so Zika is a pretty scary disease, in part because there's no cure or vaccine yet. Um, most of the people are probably aware that this can cause microcephaly in babies born to women who contracted Zika while pregnant. But in general, it's actually pretty mild for most people who aren't pregnant. Um, and there is some discussion about whether it may also cause Ju Julian Barr syndrome, where in a person's immune system damages its nerve cells. This hasn't been proven to be causative, but it's certainly considered strongly associated with this. And so I did join uh, Jim Collins' lab for my sabbatical because he and Keith Party from his lab developed an amazing method for freeze-drying gene circuits onto paper, and that allows the team to rapidly create low-cost medical diagnostics. And Zika is just one example of a nucleotide sequence that that technology can detect. Um, I was working on the fundamental technology about how to get that paper-based diagnostic to work, but my colleague, Guillaume Lambert, worked on adding CRISPR to this paper-based detection system. So what Guillaume did was he used CRISPR's dependency on the PAM sequence, which maybe you talked about in one of your previous podcasts. Yep. It's a short sequence that's at the end of the target sequence. And he was able to use that to allow CRISPR to distinguish between the American and the African strains of the Zika virus. So the American strain contains the PAM sequence, and therefore it, it gets cut by Cas9. And so that makes it not able to activate the diagnostic readout, whereas the African strain lacks that PAM sequence, and therefore um, it doesn't get cut by Cas9, and it activates the diagnostic. So um, you can get differentiation between the, the two different strains using this technology. So it's specific that it doesn't just attack all viruses. Um, the detection method you have and your team has established is that it's targeting Zika. 
Right. So what, what I like about the platform in general is um, you can put in any nucleotide sequence for it to detect. And that's part of what makes it a rapid medical diagnostic. So once the Zika virus sequence was published, our team was able to, in six weeks, go from the idea of making a Zika diagnostic all the way through submitting the paper for publication. So in only six really, weeks? In six weeks. I've never seen anything like it. All credit to my team, by the way. Not that, that's rapid in terms of you know research time. Absolutely. To make the diagnostic and then validate it um, and then write the article, it's because all you need to do is insert that sequence and it's going to be specific for whatever you're looking for. So potentially you're saying you could use it for other viruses by putting um, the other viruses sequence in there and it's kind of a machine. You put it in and then it will kind of have the output of detecting that virus. Absolutely. So it's been used, for instance, to build Ebola sensors. Um, but you're right, any sequence that you wanted, you could put into there. And then downstream of that detecting detection sequence, um, we put a reporter gene. So that could be a fluorescent molecule, as we talked about earlier. Or it could be LAC-Z, which um, results in a color change. So the paper, you can see it. It turns from yellow to purple when that nucleotide sequence of interest is actually added on there. And it sounds like it's very easy to use in the field because it's so either visual or, you know, you have the fluorescent happening if you have a certain UV light or whatever you use that you can really use it in the field. You don't have to be in a lab. So that's the idea behind it is that um, it's very low cost and then the paper based version of it, it would be would be very easy for somebody to use in the field. It, it is um, designed for global health, among other things. Definitely. That's very interesting. Um, so the first ever CRISPR human clinical trial is beginning this month, August 2016. I want to hear your thoughts about it. Um, for people that aren't aware, the trial will inject people with cells modified using the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technique. And these patients have metatastic non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so that's what the trial is going to be targeting. Um, how do you feel about the first clinical trial starting this month? Did you expect it to be this early? Well, I knew that the field is moving very rapidly. Um, I don't know if I would have expected it this soon, but I'm certainly very excited about the first trial of using CRISPRs and um, using it on T cells, which I know there's a lot of excitement to have the T cells target cancer. I have to say biology has amazed me ever since I was young, and these new tools that we have to manipulate it now, I feel like it's just mind-blowing what CRISPR can do. I feel like it's the stuff of science fiction. To take a person's cells out, as you said, alter the DNA sequence, and send those cells back into the body to kill harmful cells is just something that you never would have imagined a couple of decades ago. It, it definitely sounds like science fiction, especially using someone's own cells to fight their own cancer. It's it's kind of mind-blowing, but when you look at the science of it, it's not super hard to understand once you, you know, if you have a little bit of a background in biology. Um, as you said before, it's, it's very easy to use CRISPR as opposed to other gene editing technologies like talons or zinc fingers. Um, do you think that this is one of the reasons why it's really taken off the ease of it and how precise it is? Absolutely. I definitely think it's easier and also, I think the fact, from our perspective, that scientists in, who started this community are so willing to share both the physical materials through Agene, but also the information. I, I mean, the information we have on our website, a lot of it comes from discussions that we've had with those scientists who have developed this technology, and they are eager to help other scientists adopt it. So um, it's really just been great to see the scientific community working together on this. Definitely, and we're not going to be able to get very far without working with each other and sharing data. Um, that's, I know, a point that um, our Vice President Joe Biden has made uh, multiple times in the cancer moonshot of just how important it is in order for us to find treatments and find cures for cancer is to share data, and Agene is definitely um, at the forefront of this idea and really getting things moving in that sense. Yes, we feel really fortunate to be able to work with all the scientists that we do and to, to help move research forward in the way that we can. Um, we're always trying to improve and, and add new things, so there's more to do. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Now, do you have any um, parting advice for students that are interested in entering the fields of research or starting their own biotech company? You certainly have a lot of experience in these fields. So students who are looking to enter research, I definitely think it's worth um, being 
doing getting some experience in a lab um, and thinking about what you actually do want to study and thinking about choosing a good mentor if you're just starting out. Um, one thing it's very it's been very interesting for me to go back into Jim Collins' lab for my sabbatical and compare how I approached that versus when I had just started graduate school going into Bruce Spiegelman's lab. And um, what I found myself doing this time, which I think was actually a lot better, um, was to read the literature and really spend the first few weeks talking to people and thinking about what question I really, really wanted to ask um, versus just diving in and starting to troubleshoot some of the technical details right away um, to really get the big picture and, and think about what are the important questions to ask and what do I have at my fingertips here in this lab or collaborating with other labs in order to, to get those answers. It's definitely getting that hands-on experience and for people that may be interested in research, it's kind of like try it out because you may end up loving it. You may end up being like, um, I think I'm more of a people's person or kind of, you know, either saying I want to go for it or counting it out. Either way, it's definitely um, a good thing and just having I agree. that getting experience. That, getting that your hands into the lab and seeing if that's the lifestyle you like. I think one of the things for me at adding, I actually did like being in the lab um, and uh, asking those kind of basic questions and just, you know, actually doing the experiments and watching my gels come out. Um, but I, I do also like being at Agene, and I'm much le I spend much less time at the bench now, but I do get to talk to people about science all the time, and still I get to use my science, and, and that's a real joy. And there's so many different avenues in, you know, just the world of biology, of different career paths. It's not just, you know, going to research or just teaching. You're, you're an example of different career paths that one can take. Um, and I, I love highlighting that on the show because, you know, going in, when I was going into, say, my undergrad, um, I kind of thought that was, you know, the two main choices. But it's really, there's so many career paths and you can kind of trailblaze your own. You're absolutely right. And I've seen just even since I've started Agene, how graduate schools are now approaching that differently because not everybody who goes to graduate school is going to end up as an academic professor or even wants to. Um, and so certainly, so I trained at Harvard and now they've started a whole program where they have all these different careers where you could go after graduate school and they bring in speakers and they let people do internships, whether it's going to be patent law, starting a company, going into education. Um, there's actually a wide variety of different career paths that people could take. Definitely. Very exciting. There are so many, so many different um, paths one can take. So that wraps up today's episode of DNA Today. Thank you so much for giving us an insight into plasma sharing and CRISPR. I am just kind of obsessed with CRISPR at the moment, as a lot of people are. <laughs> I think we all are. Yes. I'm definitely going to be uh, keeping up on it the new advances in uh, CRISPR. I highly recommend exploring adgene.org. There's so much information on their blog. I kind of got lost for a couple hours on there, just reading and absorbing everything on there. Um, and it's not in totally complex language. It's language that I can understand, that you can understand. Um, there's even some fun activities like a plasmid board game that maybe I'll bust out at my next uh, genetics party or something. Um, that looks pretty fun. You can also follow on Twitter and Facebook at adgene. I'm at dnapodcast.com where you can find all kinds of episodes and lessons and all kinds of fun stuff. And also at DNA Podcast. You can shoot any questions uh, for me or Melina at info at dnapodcast.com. I'll be sure to pass along anything for her um, to her own email. So thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. I've really enjoyed talking about plasmids and learning so much. Thanks, Kara. It's a pleasure. Thanks for listening and join me next week to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics. We're all made of the same chemical DNA.